Our scripture today starts in Exodus. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God thought, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt, prepared for battle. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Sukkoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light so they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And from 1 Corinthians, love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in the glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The gift of uncertainty? Really? Is this going to be like the most bizarre sermon ever? <laughs> the gift of uncertainty? I mean, how do you feel when you're uncertain? You know, uh, consider uh, versus getting a gift. You get a gift, and how do you feel in your, in your gut? You know. Now consider like, uh, now start contemplating the presidential election. Now how do you feel? Start contemplating... The economy and the uncertainties of the economy, how do you feel? What's going to go happen in Europe this coming year? How do you, how do you feel? Um, you know, boy, those things tend to hit us in a very sharp way in the gut, uh, provoking a lot of anxiety. They don't, they don't really appear to us to be gifts. And of course, that's not just simply on the national or global level that uncertainty gives us gastric indigestion, but, you know, it it's, hits closer to home, unfortunately, doesn't it? Just uh, in the last few weeks, I have married three, uh, uh, three little kids who grew up in countryside, and, and now we're like adults and are married, you know, and, and uh, you know, we've got Katie Cunningham, uh, Dan uh, Wingert, and, I mean, Chris Wingert, <laughs> Dan's been married for a while, and, uh, and, and uh, Jerry uh, Sharkey, Jr., uh, all have been married now, and, uh, and Katie and Chris got married to each other, which is kind of fun, but you look at statistics, you know, each of our countryside kids has about a 50% chance, you know, as they go forward. Now, knowing one like I do, I would say they have a lot higher than 50% chance. I'm not personally worried for them. But, you know, that, I mean, even something as, as rock solid as, a, as, as marriage is, you've got a lot of uncertainty to it, and that doesn't make us, the uncertainty doesn't make us feel good. <laughs> um, or I think about just recently, um, you know, we, we buried one of our countryside members, um, Kristen Putnam Johnson, you know, at age 56. You know, healthy, fit, all that, and within three weeks of having a diagnosis of liver cancer, you know, we were here giving thanks you know, for her life. Well, that's uncertainty. You know. Or next week, I'm going out to, back to, to Oregon. My, my wife's mother um, passed away this last week, and you know, there, you know, it's, it's us, you know, very close to home now. She lived a much longer uh, life, and that, that's nice. But it really gets us to think about, boy, life is very uncertain, and it doesn't necessarily make us feel gifted, <laughs> does it? 
But there's something interesting about this faith tradition that suggests strongly that uncertainty um, is a gift. And in fact, and, and, and what makes it especially interesting is that, that given the faith tradition is actually we're going to kind of start kind of um, opening this up. Um, what we'll also find, though, is that religion actually does us a disservice uh, when it starts to con- try to convince us that faith leads to certainty. You know, you, we all, you know, we hear the, 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 the preachers from the pulpit and so forth, you know, who will say, you know, the Bible is perfectly clear, and if you believe certain things, you know, God will bless you, and by bless, meaning things will go your way, go okay for you. Um, your life um, will be uh, a happy one, and you will not be significantly challenged. And that doesn't just happen in, in conservative you know, circles. Or liberals have plenty of certainties, you know, too. They may no longer say, well, the Bible, is, you know, it's clear and it's certain, um, but they may say, well, you know, it's certain that Jesus you know, was this way or loved all people, whatever. Um, you know, we have our own certainties, you know, too. But what gets particularly curious is that when you look at the Bible itself, actually read the thing, um, you find that none of the heroes of the Bible lived with certainty, that they all lived in the midst of high uncertainty, that they were all significantly challenged in life. And just when things were going really well for them, they thought that maybe they, maybe for a, a brief moment in time they thought everything was going to go their way on into eternity, the bottom dropped out. All of our biblical heroes experienced that. And in fact, the only people who thrive on certainty in the Bible are the villains, <laughs> are the villains. So that should tell us something about you know, certainty and, and how productive it is in a life of faith. Now, Paul, if you ask Paul about you know, certainty and faith, I mean, the, the, that need for certainty, he said, you know, if, you, if, you, if you need certainty, you're being childish. <laughs> you know, he kind of turns that all on his head in, in this passage that we just uh, heard actually, um, you're being childish if you want uh, a lot or you need a lot of certainty, that you need to find a way of living in this world that is actually finds comfort within uncertainty. You know, of course, we know, you know children, I mean, they, they love uncertainty as long as it's, you know, pretty safe and doesn't really matter. You know, you do the little jack-in-the-box pop, you know, oh, that's really, really exciting. You know, but when it starts to get into realms that matter, kids really need certainty, like um, changing uh, the the blue sippy cup cover to the orange one just isn't going to work, is it? <laughs> Bloody murder! Oh my God, my life is now uncertain and I don't like it. <laughs> need, need black and white, need clarity, need dependability. Uh, Paul says um, in that passage, you, you heard, um, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. Another translation of that is uh, we see uh, through a glass darkly. You may have heard that one before. We see through a glass darkly. But then we will see face to face. Now we know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. In other words, yeah, eventually maybe we'll get some clarity to this whole thing called life. Um, you know, in the fullness of time, maybe. But we live in the here and now. And if you live in the here and now, you better get used to cer- uncertainty. Uh, you know, throw away those childish ways, needing to have so much certainty in your life. Grow up a bit. Uh, now, interestingly enough, that word that, that's translated dimly, mirror dimly, or through a, a glass darkly, that word darkly or dimly, um, comes from a word that, um, you know, there's a, looking through a glass darkly, comes through um, from a, a Greek word um, th- that may sound like an English one, anigmati. Does that sound like any word you know um, in English, anigmati? Yeah, enigma. That's, that's where that uh, word comes from, is anigmati. So what he's saying is, you know, you put away childish ways and, and, and realize that life is an enigma. It's an enigma. What's an enigma? Well, an enigma is mystery. It's puzzle. It's, it's, it's a difficult riddle. It's ambiguous. It's difficult to understand or interpret. That's what life is is about, according to Paul. That's what it means to have an actual, an adult faith, is to actually find comfort, not just find comfort, actually, but thrive in the midst of mystery, puzzle, riddle, ambiguousness, things that are difficult to understand and and sort out on our own. So basically, Paul is saying, (laughs) life's uncertain. Get used to it. Um, 
And, but don't just get used to it. Learn to thrive. It is truly a gift. And, you know, when, when it comes down to it, if we just kind of put our own emotions aside for a minute, just imagine going to a movie. You know, what movie have you ever loved that was totally predictable? I mean, that's not what makes a good movie, is it? I mean, a good movie, it's like you're on the edge of your seat, you know, at least emotionally engaged. You know, there may not be, need to be explosions going off, but you, you, just, can't, you just don't know what's going to happen to the, this character or these characters you've, you've kind of grown, grown to like. And, and, and what movie um, have you, is, is at all interesting if the character is always certain about what the, the, what's ahead and never has any difficulties whatsoever, no challenges, and, just, and succeeds in the end? Oh, my gosh, what a surprise. You know? And that's like boring as all get out. And yet, what kind of movie script, if we were to create a script for our own life, what would we be doing? I mean, I thank God that I'm not the creator of my own script, because I would write the most boring film for my life ever. I mean, there would be no challenges that I'd have to worry about, and I'd only ever succeed, and I'd only, things would only ever be you know, perfectly understandable to me. I wouldn't have to spend hours soul-searching and trying to you know, grope in the dark like everybody does and all that. You know? And then it's like, would I even want to watch that film? Or would I even want to live that life? There's a giftedness of, in uncertainty. Really, I, th I think that um, uh, John Ortberg got it right in his book, Faith and Doubt. He said, we all think we want certainty, but we don't. What we really want is trust wisely placed. Trust is better than certainty because it honors the freedom of people and makes possible growth and intimacy that certainty alone could never produce. It's interesting to me that in this passage that we heard from, from Paul, um, you know, he talks about life being uncertain and that, that giftedness, but the, the, the piece that immediately precedes that, those words are the greatest, is the greatest set of verses about love in the entire Bible. We read them almost every uh, wedding here that, you know, without love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love, you know, that's that passage, right? Just the second before you heard Chris, that's that passage. You know, Paul understands that love thrives when there's uncertainty, but it doesn't survive. It doesn't thrive when it's chaos. You know, what it, what it thrives in is trust. So, I mean, which one of us, if our partner is only ever, ever predictable and, and we completely understand our partner, remains interested in that relationship? I mean, most people get divorced when everything becomes too predictable, right? You know, and certainly divorced when there is no trust. You know, you know, those relationships that thrive, that, 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 that connect us deeply to love, um, are actually very, uh, are, are, are not predictable have lots of uncertainties to them, but there's a baseline of trust. You know, that allows freedom and thriving and intimacy. And that's what the scriptures keep showing us, is people, uh, time and time again, they make it into the Bible because they are faced with tremendous challenge, tremendous uncertainties, and faith does not solve it. <laughs> faith does not solve, like, like, solve it in such that they no longer are challenged or that now they are certain. Faith provides a trust and a way of being in the world that can overcome all those challenges and that uncertainty and allow a person to thrive. Now, we're going to test that out um, a moment here this morning. Um, all of you have that yellow sticky, and what we're going to invite you to do in the next couple minutes as music plays is to simply write those times in your life when God showed up for you, in however you define God, where you felt a special sense of presence or a special sense that, that life is, is greater than I imagined, that there's more generosity to life than I imagined. Maybe it was at the birth of a child. Maybe it was out in the wilderness. What were those times? I'm going to tell you, though, um, write those times down that you wouldn't mind uh, sharing by way of putting on a sticky thing out there in the, in the, in the, in the foyer. So not those deep, dark, secret ones, uh, perhaps. Well, you could. Uh, but those, those God moments. We're going to take a couple minutes, and then we're going to do something a bit uh, uh, from there. Let's find those God moments.
the paradigmatic place in the Bible that uh, uh, reveals the giftedness of uncertainty um, is the wilderness, the wilderness. Now, the, the primary training ground for d d discovering the giftedness of uncertainty and the trust that underlies, that moves us forward, is the wilderness. Not the wilderness like we can typically conceive it, like mountains and forests and, and, and streams, but like this. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, wilderness in Israelite imagination and experience, um, desolate, dry, uh, lonely, uh, places aren't well marked. Um, that's the wilderness. And of course, the formative experience of Israel um, was this exodus and 40 years of wandering in the wilderness where they had you know, kind of got to know God and the, this, the nature of the relationship. Paralleling that was Jesus. After his baptism, where did he go? into the wilderness for 40 days, that kind of a, a hearkening back to the 40 years spent in, in the wilderness. No, the wilderness is where this all really starts to come out and get uh, uh, clearer uh, in a way that points to trusting, not certainty. Um, now, the story, of course, of Israelites wandering, uh, the Israel wandering in the wilderness was preceded by this story of liberation from bondage in Egypt, which actually starts with this really interesting story about a burning bush. I mean. That to me is fascinating. If you just kind of take the story as it comes to us and not worry about did this happen exactly this way you know, 4,000 years ago in, in, in a precise way, you know, whether it did or not doesn't matter to me. What's really impressive to me is the way the story keeps happening over and over again and actually in your and my life. I mean, it keeps on the same dynamics that the story po points to are the very same dynamics I keep finding every day in my life. And when I look to that story about the burning bush, I don't just simply think, wow, that's a pretty impressive trick back then. Um, you know, now, like, you know, what, go and do likewise, go find burning bush. You know, I've never seen a burning bush. But what, to me, the story signifies to me is, well, first of all, I mean, this was the central kind of piece that starts the whole liberation from bondage, you know, going, is that God revealing God's self. And how? in something that completely overturns our ability to understand, in a, burn, a bush that burns but is not consumed, right? So right there, we should automatically uh, we should get a, a good clue that this God, certainty is not particularly an important thing to this God, uh, that actually God is going to do more to overturn our certainties than confirm them. A bush that burns that is not consumed. And then God says, I will, you know, God reveals God's name. Moses says, what's your name? God says what? My name is Yahweh. What does Yahweh mean? Well, you can, there's really two primary ways of translating that. One is, I am who I am. Oh, now that clarifies things, doesn't it? <laughs> who are you? I am who I am. Thanks. <laughs> the other way of translating that is, I will be who I will be. <laughs> Not much help there, is it? God's not going to give us a lot to go by with I am who I am or I will be who I will be. But that is the way that is central to the revelation here. And yet every time God shows up in whatever way God will be or whatever, God, whatever God, way God is, there's, there's a nature and character to it that always tends to point us in the direction of our next steps. So even though Moses has his whole world turn on, his head, on its head when he sees this burning bush that is not consumed. And even though God is revealed as, I am who I am, I will be who I will be, he receives marching orders. He receives an intuition of his next step. Go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And of course, Moses is like, whoa, that's a pretty tall order. And he objects. He doesn't see this as possible, even though he's just seen what's impossible. Um, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm a stutterer. I can't speak even. I mean, that's what the, the, when he says, I am slow of tongue, that's a Hebrew way of saying I stutter. Um, I can't even speak. So, you know, so they kind of go back and forth, and finally uh, Moses goes, and he's got his marching orders. That if you look to those times in your life where God shows up, when you sense that there's more to life than meets the eye, and that there is a more of a gracious generosity to life than you ever imagined, normally those times don't simply warm us but they indicate a direction for us. They, give a, they call us into a certain way of being in the world that's oftentimes unique to us. So Moses gets this call. He goes to, to confront Pharaoh, and, uh, and, and he looks surprisingly like Charlton Heston in this, in this photograph uh, here, but I'm told that's original. Um, he, you know, he, he, he confronts Pharaoh, 
And if Moses were now um, clinging to a lot of certainties, there's no way that the slaves ever would have left Egypt. Why? Because he goes and confronts Pharaoh. Okay, I'm finally taking God seriously. Let my people go. And if he clung to the certainty that you know God's gonna, God is gonna let them, he would be awfully disappointed by Pharaoh's response. You know, hell no, <laughs> right? Huh? But but God told me you would. You know? So then, okay, well I'll show you a sign. You know? No, not gonna do it. I'll show you another sign. Nah, not doing it for me. Sign after sign, Pharaoh keeps coming back, no after no. If Moses clung to certainty, yes, I'll let my, your people will go, and that was all the be-all, end-all, the relationship, he would have given up surely by the fourth or fifth time anyway, saying, well, this God thing must be a, a, a crock of a, a hooey. You know, like, this, doesn't, this isn't working, right? But he didn't have certainty, he had trust. And so despite that, he kept coming back and coming back and coming back, kept getting disappointed, disappointed at disappointment, and yet, Eventually, Pharaoh does let the people go. So amidst a, a God who turns the table in this burning bush that's not consumed, who's revealed in, in I will be who I will be, I am who I am, real concrete liberation from bondage actually happens. Slaves are let free amidst all this uncertainty. Trust. So they get to, uh, they, get, they start to leave, and then we hear the passage, God, he's kind of thinking, okay, what route shall I send them on? Well, there's the, there's the sure and certain route uh, going along the edge of the, of the Mediterranean there. Nope, I'm not going to do that because they would get killed there. The Philistines would rise up and they would be at war. Uh, I'll send them by way of the, the wilderness. Interesting little note. I mean, why would the author even bring up what's going on in God's brain, if, well, or consciousness, uh, about deciding between those two paths, the way that's sure and certain that follows kind of the Mediterranean or thrust out in the wilderness, and there's, oh, by the way, there's a sea blocking your way there. Um, you know, to me, what's going on there is that's the Hebrew way of, of, of also, again, pointing to what goes on in our life. Um, what the, the story is trying to tell us, you know, in, in, in kind of letting us in on God's uh, thought process, is that, again, the route that is clear and certain in your life, if that's what becomes most important to you, getting, getting to the promised land through clearness and certainty, it will kill you. Don't do it. That the route to the promised land is through the wilderness. And before you get to the wilderness, you're going to confront the impossible. That's the route to the promised land. And so they, they, they're they out there, and they're all excited to go out, but then they, they, they're at the sea, they're like, wait a minute, and then here comes the Egyptians, the Pharaoh's changed his mind. You know? It's like, well, wait a minute, this was, you know, God was with us, God liberated us, and now we, we're confronted with this sea, and now they're coming up after us. Um, is this God with us or what? So just because they're liberating from bondage doesn't mean their lives just become then clear and certain there. It's like they're, they're actually thrust into more profound uncertainty, more profound challenge. And yet, that, that the wisdom of the story says that when you follow in the way that God, those, those, that, that fire inside reveals, that when you take that next step with God, God can make a way where there is no way that appears to you. That in your own life, when you're following that sense, that edge of spirit, really being intentional, trying to surrender to that. That just because you're, you're, you're confronted with a seemingly impossible object, obstacle, that's not the end of the story. God can make a way where there is no way. Now what really confounds me about that story, though, is that you'd think that after the parting of the Red Sea, I mean, the way that has been made, you know, they, they go through on, on dry ground. The sea then swallows up the enemy. They're on this, they've got to be on the spiritual high like there's no tomorrow. I mean, having the biggest celebration ever, like, oh, God is real and really, you know, with us, and now life is really great. That's when they hit the wilderness. And for 40 years, they're lost in this wilderness, not knowing the way forward. They have to, they get into other, we'll get into how they get across. 
But to me, that's fascinating. And isn't that the way it goes in our lives, too? Is that we can, things can be, can be going along really well, and we can be really feeling like, you know what, I caught that edge, and I actually followed it, and I actually have, have, have more, fit, I'm feeling more alive than ever, and things just happen to be going in a very nice direction for me, by the way. Thank you very much, oh God. And then the next day, <laughs> you know, and we think, what did I do wrong? Did I fail in some, you know, not quite get the point there? Or is, did God just kind of change God's mind or, or, or what? And yet the story would strongly suggest that just because you find yourself in the wilderness may not have anything to do with you doing something wrong. It's as a result of you doing something right. <laughs> just because the road gets tough does not mean the giftedness have left you. That does not mean that you are no longer blessed. And, and oh, if we could not just see into the future. If the Hebrews, when they found themselves out in the wilderness, you know, they start, life starts getting tough. But what do they start doing? They start to pine for the good old days of slavery. Oh, we may have not had so many freedoms, but gee, we, you know, we knew what, who we were and what we were supposed to do, and we had our guaranteed one square meal a day, and it wasn't life just great. You know, they start to pine like that. Would, if they only could have seen into the future what God had in store, and to have had the confidence, that trust, you know, to see what their end result was. But, of course, none of us get that. All we have to is the trust. And sure enough, time and time again in that wilderness where they thought there was a way, there was no way, I mean, water's coming out of rocks, food's coming out of the sky, and so much, so many times in our own lives, you know, just when we think it can't possibly get any worse, and then it does, and then we think, well, I might as well give up. That's right at the point where it seems like something falls from the sky. Something comes out of a rock, and we're fed, and we're nourished. And we're thinking, God, why, did, why couldn't I have trusted, you know, the last 24 hours? So they, they go wandering in this wilderness. How did they get from one place to another place? It was this pillar of fire said that they appeared to them. I love, again, that, that mythological imagination. A pillar of fire appeared. What would happen was uh, this, this fire would appear in the distance, and they would know, okay, we, we go this way, and, and they would get up to where that pillar was, and they would set up their camp, and then that pillar of fire would dissipate into this cloud, this cloud, foggy cloud. And uh, I love that, too, because, I mean, God's presence is never clear. It's always fogginess about it. You can't quite grasp it, but it's there. And then after a while, they would, uh, that, so the cloud would lift and that, that pillar of fire would appear in the distance and they would have to disassemble all their comforts and all their, their tents in the sanctuary. And all, they'd have to take it all apart, set up, you know, dismantle and, and, and follow to where that fire was and then go again. I think what the mythological imagination of that passage is trying to, to point us to is, I mean, notice, pillar of fire and where was the last time we saw fire? It was in that burning bush. I think what the, the writer is trying to suggest to us is that when you find yourself in your own wilderness, uh, pay attention to where the fire is. Where are those times when you sense your own burning bush? When you sense that, that closeness, that presence, that, that sense that life is more generous than you ever gave it credit for, that you have more reason to trust than you ever did? normally contained within those experiences is a hint, is a suggestion of your next step forward. And while the whole way may not appear very clear, you eventually find yourself in the promised land, simply one step at a time, being willing to dismantle what you had assembled so carefully and go to that next place where the flame is. Now, here's the official end of the, the sermon, but I'm going to give you just a little addendum. Once they get to the promised land, does life go become suddenly now certain for them? <laughs> Heck no. Because the gift of uncertainty is way too big a gift for God to deprive God's children of it. So even in the promised land, the children of the promise exist just as they had in the wilderness, only perhaps with a hint more trust. And perhaps we too 
standing on the shoulders of our predecessors. May you also take their experiences and have just a, a hint more trust that this God is real, that this God really is aware of you and me more than we are aware of you and me and really does guide us step by step, never with certainty, never with perfect clarity, but does guide us step by step to the new land of promise in our own lives.